ready? Good morning. Would you please stand and join us as we begin our worship and song? Father, we are here rejoicing in you, and you truly do live, and we thank you that you live within us, you lead us and guide us, and you do save us. So Lord, we're here rejoicing in you today. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that was, uh, that was good. I even saw some people clapping, heard some people clapping, and a few people even doing this. That was, that was kind of bold, but... Uh, yeah, wouldn't you agree, Redeemer lives? Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, even a hand clap. All right. I've got a few announcements to make, and so I'm going to go through those as quick as I can. Dave, you've got a video you're going to throw up real quick, or did that work? Oh, yep, let's go ahead and do that. You guys can look at that one or this one or whichever one you want to look at. God is on the move, and he's moving in eastern Oregon. He's drawing people healing hearts, bringing hope, uniting the church. This year, churches all across Morrow and Umatilla counties are coming together to launch a unified, region-wide evangelistic effort called Greater Hermiston City Fest. City Fest will make a deep impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ as together we reach out to those in need of hope. 
this gospel movement is dependent on the Holy Spirit, of course, and dependent on you. And it starts with us right now, getting our hearts and our minds rightly focused, spiritually invigorated. The launch for the festival is called Renew. This is a special night for all of the brothers and sisters to gather the church together, worshiping together as one body to prepare our hearts for this powerful season of outreach. Join me, Andrew Palau, and Jose Zayas, my friend, pastor of 26 West in Hillsboro, on Thursday, May 13th for this amazing night of prayer and worship. Many, many of us gathered from across the region to seek the face of God and humble ourselves through unified worship and to ask God to move, to move powerfully that all of Umatilla and Mora counties would hear the voice of God. Don't miss the Renew Gathering. It's free, it's for the whole church, it's a pivotal moment and an essential step forward for the gospel right here in Oregon that we love so very, very much. And I personally want to invite you to come to this special event, the Renew Gathering right here in Hermiston, May 13th at New Hope Community Church. I'll see you there. All right, thank you, David. So Renew is happening. It's a Thursday night, 6.30. Um, if you want more information, I can get that to you. I've got some little flyers I can hand out. But this is in preparation for the uh, City Fest, which is happening uh, later this summer. And so if you want to come join, the nice thing about this is we're, reuni reuniting, we're reuniting Christians in the community together to reach out to uh, those that don't know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so how do we disciple? How do we bring evangelism into our community? So it's going to be a great opportunity for churches to work together. So that's happening May 13th. Um, VBS is coming, and there's places to get involved, and there's a board out back to sign up. But this is happening too. And so mark your calendars for uh, July 12th through the 16th. But there's places to uh, be involved in that. And Lorraine's in charge of it. Raise your hand, Lorraine, so they, they're, she's the one, and that board is filling up fast. But, you know, if you want to just come and love on kids, that'll be a great opportunity. Um, if you look in your bulletin, too, the, the fishing trip's happening May uh, 21st and 22nd, and Steve Smith, where are you at, Steve? Raise your hand. Raise, oh, okay, Steve's right over there, but he's the guy. If you want to go fishing, he'll tell you what to use, where to use, and and uh, we're going to come together, have a big fishing event, and then a fish fry. I'm assuming if we catch fish, we'll do that. <laughs> the, the church is waking up. It seems like, you know, we've been kind of shut down, and so things are starting to happen. May 9th, Mother's Day, uh, there will not be any classes, but the men's group uh, under Bill Porfili's leadership is uh, doing a breakfast. And he's shaking his head, but he's in charge. Um, <laughs> But we're doing a breakfast that morning. And so mothers come and be honored at nine o'clock. The breakfast will start and we'll go till about a quarter to 10. Uh, but it'll be a great time of fellowship and uh, just honoring mothers. So that's coming in a couple weeks. Youth group, Claire, you've got an announcement. All right, thank you. And then Cassie, you have uh, something you want to share with us? Thank you, Cassie. That is really all of our announcements uh, in your bulletin. There's things happening coming forward. The True Care 
Bottle Drive campaign, that's coming soon. Uh, Inland Northwest concert, May 22nd, that's going to happen here at the church, which is exciting to uh, open our church to the community. So different ways to get involved, um, step into an area of ministry and step into a place of fellowship. So that's really all I have. Dan, are you uh, sharing with us today? All right. Good. Good morning, everybody. Boy, I, it is good to see the seats just get fuller and fuller. Oh, it's a good thing. Uh, this morning we're going to be reading from Ephesians one uh, three, starting in verse three. Um, <clears throat> It's like jumping into the deep end of the pool right away. Every sentence in this passage is just full, full of meaning, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, let's begin. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the, to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. We pray with me? Father, we thank you. Uh, thank you for a beautiful spring day. We thank you that... Um, uh, Father, I thank you that people are returning to church and that, uh, that we, we are feeling more free to, to uh, worship you corporately. Father, I pray that uh, as we do that, our, that our worship would be sweet. Father, that your spirit would be present among us and that it would just be a, a, a blessing to us and a, and a sweet aroma to you. Father, we pray that you'd be with Pastor John as he brings your word, that uh, you, you would uh, equip him to open it to us and that your spirit would work in our hearts and minds today. We pray, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand to join us as we continue in our worship?
love that song. that kind of had me thinking all week. I uh, met a man who went into prison in his 20s, and he won't get out of prison till his 50s. And so we got into a conversation, and somehow it came to church. And he looked straight at me and says, when you're sitting in your church, do you ever feel guilty and like you don't deserve to be there? And I said, absolutely, and no, that who, will, who can be here, who's worthy, none of us and all of us. And that very morning, I had just read out of this little book, Valley of Vision, which if you don't have this, it's just beautiful. I love this. It says, and this to teach me, not to try to rule and conquer sin, but to cleave to the one who will do all for me. Thou hast made known to me that to save me is Christ's work, but to cleave to him by faith is my work, and with this faith is the necessity of my daily repentance. So just the beauty that the work of the Christian is to believe what Jesus says to be true of us. Oh 
Almighty God, thank you for sending your Son. Lord, that we live in his abilities, his grace, his love. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have brought us to redemption through your Son, Jesus. Lord, as we look to your word today, I'd ask that our hearts... Lord, our part is to trust, put our faith in you, Lord Jesus. Waken our hearts, our minds through your word that we would be changed or that we would leave with the message of salvation ringing strong in our minds and heart today. So Holy Spirit, feed us, anoint us, and guide us. Lord, we ask these things in your precious name. Such a pretty girl. It's my daughter. I, I do. Yeah. Well, that was that was that was Lydia. But yes, I do have two pretty girls. Well, three pretty girls. Yeah. All right. Children's church. Oh yes, they're out the door. Emma, are you helping? Yeah. Oh, good for you. Okay. <laughs> Any other kids? What's the age limit? Third grade. Third grade in preschool to third grade. So I, I, see, I see a couple other girls here maybe heading out. They go to the annex, the building right next door here. Okay. All right. We are today in 2 Thessalonians. So if you have a Bible, electronic or otherwise, turn with me to chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I, I will read verses 13, 14, and 15. That is the text we're going to be looking at today, and it reads as follows. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you brothers beloved by the Lord because God chose you as the first fruits now I'm going to stop there just for a moment there is a variant reading God chose you from the beginning let's do a little survey here if you've got a Bible open how many of you have the reading first fruits go ahead and raise your hand how many of you have the reading from the beginning? How many of you don't have a Bible open? <laughs> okay, because quite a few hands I don't think went up. Um, there are variant readings in the New Testament, and these are, these are because the, the Greek manuscripts were copied over the centuries, and so this is an example of this. Most often the decision as to how you should read it is pretty clear. This one is not so clear. The manuscript evidence breaks virtually 50-50. And there are old manuscripts with both of these renderings. And to make it even more interesting, the words are almost identical in Greek. Not in English, but in Greek. In fact, it's almost just the difference of a space, whether you read it first fruits or from the beginning. And, and so the ESV renders first fruits because it follows the Revised Standard Version. The editors of the ESV, the, the men, women who put this translation together, they used as their starting point the Revised Standard Version, and that version of the Bible has first fruits. It's also interesting that if you, have, if you have older editions of some of our translations, you'll find sometimes they change their mind. I think the, ES, the NIV does this, and I can't remember how it works. I did look at it last week. Uh, one of the older versions has it one way, and newer versions have it the other way. 
And so that, that just tells you that the, the call is so tight here that the Greek scholars themselves... Now, think about this for a moment. There are men and women in this world who spend their entire lives just sitting around tables, so to speak, arguing over the meaning of Greek words and whether it should be this word or that word or Hebrew words. Anybody want to spend your life doing that? Well, there are people who do, and, and you know, we should be thankful for them. Now, the King James, probably, you know, it's, it's a set text. It's like a, like a fossil. It doesn't change, which isn't a criticism of the King James. It's just, you know, it's been around for so long. It's not an active text. They're not still working with it. I suppose if they're still working with it, we call that the New King James. But I'm going I'm to just give you my opinion here. I think from the beginning is actually preferable. And I'm not basing that so much on manuscript evidence. I'm, I'm basing it on context. If you look at the context of this passage, I think it just makes more sense. It fits better based on what Paul is discussing this morning to read this as from the beginning. And so I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to read it that way, and we're going to treat the text that way, which is if you have an ESV, you'll, you'll find that as a note at the bottom of your page. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you from the beginning to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now, let me just make this uh, observation. Now, I've been the pastor here for 25 years and during that time frame I've had a lot of people ask me questions and one of the questions that has been asked of me more than almost any other question has to do with the whole issue of election the whole issue of predestination in fact I've been asked that question three times Three different people who tend this church in the last couple of months. And I've not been preaching on that topic. But I just have people come to me from time to time on a pretty regular basis over all these years. What does the Bible mean when it talks about election, predestination? And all the synonyms that go along with that. And there's a whole bunch of those synonyms. And, and I think it makes sense that that question is asked. And it makes sense because if you're a Bible reader, and I hope that you are, but if you are a Bible reader, you're going to encounter that idea on a fairly consistent basis as you work your way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So again, it makes sense to me that people will encounter this concept as they're reading the Bible, and therefore, of course, they'll think, well, what does this mean? And so they'll go to their pastor and they'll ask the question. I just a month or so ago had one of you in my office for probably over an hour just discussing this very issue. I, I really, you all know that I like R.C. Sproul. I, uh, I've learned so much from him and benefited so much from him. In one of his books, he makes a really... I think a really helpful observation. He says that every, every Bible reader, every Christian, believes in predestination. And, and he goes on to explain what he means by that. He says every Bible reader believes in predestination because, because the Word is in the Bible. So therefore, if you're a Bible reader, you've got to believe in predestination. I, I had Dan read from Ephesians chapter 1 this morning because... That word is found in that text, I believe, twice. And the English rendering is an interesting rendering. It's a helpful rendering. If you just think about it, you try to break words down, that word has a prefix, pre, and then a root. And the root means destination, and the prefix, pre, means before or in advance of. So if you get on an airliner and you're flying to Heathrow in London... The plane, so to speak, is predestined to land in London at a certain hour of the day because, you see, that's the trajectory. The trajectory that's where the plane is destined to go. 
And so R.C. Sproul was pointing out that everybody believes in this doctrine called election because it's in the Bible. What we don't agree about is what it means. You see? That's where all the, the difficulty comes and, and all the, the fighting and so forth. I, I do remember I've I've been a Bible reader my entire life, and I can remember being a young person and just reading various passages. One of them, um, Acts 13, 48, and the context of that passage is that Paul has gone to a city, and he's preaching in the synagogue, and he's eventually thrown out of the synagogue, and, and he, makes, uh, he, he makes a statement, I'm going to go to the Gentiles, and he continues to preach. And then there's this observation, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, you've got to stop and think about that, don't you? I mean, that, that, that's a passage that just makes you stop and think. I can remember as a, as a seventh grade boy reading a text like that and wondering, what does that mean? I was puzzled by that. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So they believe, but the text seems to be suggesting the reason they believe is that something prior to that takes place they were appointed to that end. I can also remember, and I've shared this before, sitting in a college class at George Fox College. I went there to study history, not theology. But sometimes theology would come up, and this was a class on uh, American intellectual history and the reality that our forefathers were descendants of the Puritans, and they were what we would call Calvinists. And I can remember the professor was very exercised about this, and, and he, he, he gave a discussion of how he understood the doctrines of grace, is what they're called, and then he dismissed the whole thing and said, I'm so grateful that nobody believes this today. And, and I've thought since then, that's the most ignorant statement I ever heard in a college classroom. It really, truly, I mean, what an incredibly ignorant statement that actually was. At any rate, um, these are difficult topics. There's no doubt about it. But I want to remind you something of something that is interesting, it's important, and it should shame us. I think it really should. It should shame us. Paul, when he talks about election, almost always, with the possible exception of Romans 9, Paul almost always talks about election in the context of encouraging Christians. He does so to build your faith. He does so in the context of saying, as he's doing in this passage, think about the context of this passage. Thessalonica, a culture that had turned these Christians out, had marginalized them, had said, we can't accept you. We, we cannot accept what you believe. All of a sudden, it begins to sound kind of contemporary, doesn't it? Because as Christian people, we are living in a culture increasingly where we're being told your Christian belief system is simply unacceptable to us. And so, you either get with the program and give up your belief system and we'll accept you or we're going to punish you in various ways. And, and if you pay attention to the news, you can, you can find affirmation of this almost every day now. So this is what was happening back then. The whole context of these Thessalonian letters is the persecution of the church. And so what Paul is doing here is he's He's pointing out to these people, Thessalonian believers, you clearly are not the chosen of your culture. You're the, you're the despised of your culture. Your culture has no purpose for you at all. But I want to encourage you with the thought that you are the beloved, the chosen of God. And so Paul speaks this truth into this context, as he does almost everywhere else in the New Testament, as a way of encouraging Christians. Now, I say that it's to our shame and to our 
We should be ashamed of ourselves because when we hear this doctrine, we inevitably break into our warring camps and fight over it. There's got to be something wrong with us when we take something that the Bible teaches in order to build us in our faith and encourage us, and we fail to be encouraged. We have the exact opposite response. So, as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture, and, and by the way, it does say here, God chose you from the beginning to be saved. See, that's, that's why I've started the way that I have, because the actual words of the Bible, these are, these are words that are hard to explain except the way they're written. God chose you from the beginning to be saved. But to realize that Paul's intent in telling us this is not that we can lob insults at one another or have another church split because, you know, there's the free will Baptists, and then there's the more Calvinist Baptists. No, Paul's intention in all of this is that we would rejoice. And so we've got to find a way to rejoice in these truths. Or we're not hearing the Bible the way Paul intends us to hear it. So now coming to the text, verse 13, let's just begin to work through this together, and I'll try to to do the best of my ability to just work through and tell you what these words mean and try to apply it to our lives, Paul says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you. So he begins with benediction, doesn't he? And his, his thanksgiving is directed to God, isn't it? And it's directed to God because Paul recognizes that the, the reason there is a believing, functioning, joyful church in the city of Thessalonica is God. It's the grace of God. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of these individuals who've brought them to faith. And so Paul gives thanks to God because he knows that the credit goes to God. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. Now, this verb here, translated beloved in my English Bible, it's in the perfect tense in Greek, and this is a bit hard to explain, and I don't, know, I don't know whether this will come across quite the way I intend it to. Greek is a very expressive language. It's more expressive than English. And this perfect tense, the, the sense of the nuance of meaning of it is something that is complete in the past, complete, finished, done, like he chose you before the foundation of the world. But then the emphasis from there on is it's completed action with ongoing continuous results as you walk your way into the present. And this is called the perfect tense in Greek. It's somewhat unusual. And so when you encounter it, it usually means that the author wants you to stop and think and and ponder, why did he choose to use this tense? So it's emphasizing that the Christians are beloved of God, if you will, in the plan of God in eternity past, but that love that God has for them extends into the present reality in which they find themselves. So they're the brothers, the sisters in Christ, rejected by the culture, hated by the culture, but beloved by the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the beginning. And so it does make us think of Ephesians chapter 1, where we were chosen before the foundation of the world. God in eternity past. Because God chose you from the beginning to be saved. Now, I want to look at the word to choose here and just give you the lexical definition. So if you have a Greek lexicon, you start opening that up either in a book form or as I have it on a, in a computer form. Oh, the computers are so nice. All those books, you just click, 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 and everything opens up. It's just wonderful. I've got the old stuff because I'm an old man now. 
I got those books on the shelves. I never use them because the computer does it for you. But this word means to choose. So we've got a good translation here, to prefer or to select. The lexical definition reads as follows, to select for one's own purpose from a number of alternatives. Now, the word is used interestingly in the Old Testament, and I want to just direct your attention to one passage. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I'd invite you to turn back there, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I'll read verses 6 through 8. And the context here, of course, is the children of Israel and how God placed his love upon them as a people, as a nation. And this particular verb used in 2 Thessalonians in, in its compound form is used twice in this text in Deuteronomy. And I want to read both of those to you. You might be surprised how it's translated in Deuteronomy, but it actually makes me wonder if when Paul was writing 2 Thessalonians, when he wrote the paragraph we're looking at this morning, I don't know this, but it's not impossible that Paul in his morning devotions had read Deuteronomy 7. Certainly possible because there's, the passages are so parallel in, in so many ways. Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning in verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. That's the word, right? Okay, chosen you. Just like it's translated in 2 Thessalonians. It's the second use that will surprise you. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. See, the second use of the verb is translated, set his love on you. So this word, translated to choose, and this choosing that takes place from the beginning, it's rooted in God's love. God set his love upon you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So the context here is not that God chose them because they were so outstanding. It's rather that God chose them because he set his love upon them. God chose them and not the Egyptians. God chose them and not Pharaoh. Because the whole context of Deuteronomy is emphasizing that truth. That this particular people, this nation, now to be sure they have been chosen to be a blessing to the world. Let us not forget that. But in the election of God, this group of people in the Old Testament has been favored and chosen above others. And that choosing is rooted in God's love for them. And so when we come into this New Testament text, recognizing that meaning is determined by words, and the words of the Old Testament, as, as Paul, if you cut Paul, he would have bled Old Testament. It's everywhere within him. It shapes his mind and it shapes his heart. And so he's saying to these Thessalonians, you are the New Testament people of God. You also are the children of Abraham. You are a select special people. The world hates you. The world rejects you. But God has chosen you from the beginning to be saved. Now, we looked last Sunday, actually, at this word to be saved. It has, of course, a theological meaning, and that's the primary meaning that we assign to it. But we also do recognize that this word is used in the Bible in a variety of other contexts. I'll just give you one example of this. In the Old Testament, you remember that story where David is in the city of Jerusalem and his son is in rebellion against him? What was his son's name? Absalom. You do know this story. Excellent. Absalom is bent on David's destruction. And, and word comes to the king that his son is coming and his intent is to 
usurp the kingdom, to take over, to replace David. And David in 2 Samuel turns to his supporters and his advisors and he says, Arise and let us flee or else there will be no escape for us from my son. There will be no escape. That's the word used here in the New Testament for salvation. The word we associate with the death of Jesus on the cross that saves us from our sins. So the word means to be delivered from a catastrophe. And of course, it would have been a catastrophe if David had not fled the city. And you know eventually how that story ends up. So the word means to rescue, to escape, to be delivered. I think what I said last Sunday is if you imagine a, two men in a boxing ring and, and one man is getting the worst of the fight and we have this expression that as he's being pummeled, we say he was saved by the bell, right? If that round had gone on for another 15 seconds, it would have been, he would have been done. And we realize that when he goes into the next round, he might be done. But for that brief moment, he was rescued, he was delivered by the bell. Now, of course, when Paul talks here that God chose you from the beginning to be saved, the idea is that we've been saved from sin. The idea is that we've been saved from God's judgment. So again, the R.C. Sproul story I told last Sunday is R.C.'s walking across the college campus at Temple University and and this man approaches him and says, are you saved? And R.C. says, saved from what? And the young man whose intentions are all the best, but, you know, he wasn't prepared for that. It threw him off the script, and he didn't really know what to say at that moment. Saved from what? Ultimately saved from the righteous wrath and judgment of God. That's what we're saved from, aren't we? And in fact, Paul makes this point very clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then chapter 5 and verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation, same word, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's good news, isn't it? Is there any news better than that? And again, to go back to the context, we've always got to try to remember how the original audience would have heard these words as they were under the displeasure of their culture, under the wrath of their culture. Go back and read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and underline words that talk about suffering and tribulation and being hard-pressed and being rejected. And then to realize that we've been saved, brought into a relationship with God. That is the best news that we can ever hear. He goes on to say that we've been saved through sanctification. I think the idea being here that, that God's purpose, He sets us apart, He works in our hearts, he changes us from the inside out. So it's sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. If you want to water your yard, assuming you don't have an in-ground sprinkler system, but you've got a spigot, what do you do? What's that? Someone said you turn it on. Is that going to water your yard? Yes. You, you hook a hose and a sprinkler to the spigot, and then the hose becomes the instrument or the conduit that the water flows through in order to water your yard. So in other words, you water your yard by means of the hose. I point that out to you as an illustration because of the structure here of the text Paul is saying you're saved by means of believing the truth. 
Faith becomes the conduit. It, be, it serves like the hose by which the saving water gets to the yard. And so we are saved through what Christ has done for us, but the way that that impacts our lives is by believing this truth. Now, we understand that, don't we? Now, I hope we also understand, though, that even here, the Bible, when we dig into this, the Bible always takes us deeper. So, one of those verses that perhaps you've memorized, I'm not good at Bible memorization. I'm an excellent Bible reader. I'm not a good memorizer of Scripture. Larry Newman's a good memorizer of Scripture. I've observed this over the years as he'll quote at length sometimes, and I know he's just, he's memorized a text. But I have memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God that no man may boast. So we're saved by grace through faith, but then the Bible says this faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of of God. Again, the Bible's always humbling us. The Bible's saying to us, in your lost spiritual condition, apart from the grace of God actually extending this gift of faith, you won't repent. You won't believe. So all the glory for all of this ultimately belongs to God. Now let's look at verse 15. Skip down with me to verse 15, which is really our response to this truth. He says, so then, brothers, and he means, of course, brothers and sisters, Christian people, so then stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Again, the imagery here is, is of a all the appendages of the person are involved in this. He says, stand firm. You think of your feet. You think of a gale force wind trying to knock you over. He's saying, stand firm. Stand against that gale force wind and hold on to. That's your hands. Grab hold of these traditions that you've been taught and don't let go of them. Don't let anything take them from you because, beloved, right now counts forever. Do you believe that? right now counts forever. Right now is significant. Right now will influence how you live in the future. Right now will determine how you think in the future. And so Paul is saying, you have received a tradition. You have been given the gospel. It is a great treasure. Hold on to that with every ounce of your being. Don't let go of it. Don't ignore it. Now, this word tradition, surprise, not surprising, it's also used elsewhere in the Bible. It's sometimes used of human traditions, things that we would say are not true. And so tradition can be good, it can be bad. Context determines. There's so much in our culture today that that is of the opposite. It is tradition that would take you away from the gospel and take you away from Christ. Paul is saying, don't go there. Don't follow that way. Everyone's a theologian. It's just a lot of people are lousy theologians. Because you see, we all hear things and we all internalize things. We all believe things. There's a tradition that we receive. You hear it on television. You hear it in the classroom. You hear it at church. And Paul is saying, hold on to that tradition that you receive from us, that pure, unadulterated gospel, because right now counts forever. Don't allow the culture to rob you of this. And of course, again, it's rooted in this idea of all that God has done for us. And then go back to verse 14. 
To this end, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes when I study a passage of Scripture, in fact, this happens often, and we're almost done. But when I study and prepare to preach a passage of Scripture, so, you know, tomorrow I'll begin that process for next Sunday. And because I preach virtually every Sunday, you know, if you preach once a month, you're a better preacher. Do you realize this? If you've got a month to think about a text and read, you can hit home runs. But you've got to do it every week week after week after week. I don't know what I'm preaching next Sunday. I really have no clue. I have not had time to look at that text. I'll start that tomorrow. So this is what happens week after week after week. And so often when I start to look into a text, I'm stunned by the depth of it. And that's certainly true with this text. I mean, there is so much here. I mean, for one thing, it's a Trinitarian text. Did you notice that? It is Trinitarian. Verse 13, we give thanks to God the Father for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord Jesus Christ, because God chose you to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit. So all three persons of the Trinity are at work in this text, in the salvation of God's people. The other thing that really struck me about this text is that I don't have the language for this. It is so all-encompassing. It begins from the beginning in eternity past, and it takes us all the way forward into our future glorification. Did you notice that? I mean, it's like from A to Z. And then as the text unfolds, how God chose us in the past, but he's chose us to be saved. He's chose us to be sanctified. He's chose us for a future glorification. And so it's just this deep, deep passage. And all that God is going to do for us, the glory of it is at the very center of all of it. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you may be glorified. That you may be made glorious. Now language fails us here, doesn't it? What that will be like when we see Jesus face to face when we are so transformed that we can endure seeing Jesus face to face, when we are made glorious in such a way that the glory radiates from us. And that's the thought I'm going to leave you with this morning because it's the thought that takes us to the absolute opposite extreme of where these people were living in their cultural context in the city of Thessalonica. They were not the glorified ones. They were not the honored ones. They were not the chosen ones. They were the ones despised and rejected, just like Jesus But if you read Philippians chapter 2, after the humiliation comes the glory. And so Paul is reminding them, your future is so unbelievably bright. You would be a fool to not hold on with absolute tenacity to what you have been taught and to what you have believed. Let me close with these words. Romans chapter 8. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and of children than heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Father God, I thank you for a really, truly great salvation, a salvation that is far greater, I suspect, than 
than we understand. I'm sure it is far greater than we understand. I thank you that you are a God who has blessed us. You are a God who's called us out of darkness into light. Lord, at the end of the day, we know that it has to be your work within us because apart from that work, we would be lost, dead in our trespasses and sins. We thank you that you are the God who's made us alive. You've brought us to spiritual life. And your purpose extends beyond this life into the next life when we will be glorified with you. Lord God, I, I don't know all the circumstances of every person here today, but I pray, Lord, to the God who knows every person, every heart, every fear, every struggle, every circumstance. And Lord, my prayer would be that your Holy Spirit would take these words and use them to strengthen us and to build us up in our faith, that we would live for you, that we would serve you, that we would be at peace with you, that we would rejoice in you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us as we sing our closing song.
to have a membership class at some point. I don't have dates and particulars of that yet. Kind of depends who responds, but I, I've got one couple who would like to join the church. If you've thought about membership and would be interested in exploring that, come and talk to me and we'll try to catch, you know, several of you at once. Um, and I do call it exploring membership because it's possible you'd go through the class and say, I don't think I want to join and that would be okay. So, but if you want, if you're interested in that, let me know. And um, also, you know, if you want to talk about theology, my office is really open to you to do that. Um, if I've said something today that you don't understand or maybe it's difficult, obviously there's a whole lot more to this subject than I was able to say today. I, I enjoy having those conversations, even when, even when you disagree with me. Um, I enjoy it usually, but... Um, <laughs> On things like this, you know, election, for instance, we don't always have to agree perfectly, right? If you come to me and say you deny the deity of Christ, I'll say, um, I say, I'll pray for your soul. I mean, I don't think you're a Christian. But if you disagree with me on this, I'll say, you might be a better Christian than I am, you know. So, but I do enjoy having those conversations and, and you know, I invite you if, you, if you want to talk, feel free to call me. Father God, I do thank you for this day, and I just ask your blessing upon uh, this afternoon. This is the day you have made. Every day is a gift of your grace. Help us, Lord, to walk with you uh, and, and, and to rejoice in your Son. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.